Space is both a terrifying and intriguing subject. Space can mean numerous possibilities for anyone. Space can also represent loneliness and awe. And I don't think any other game has achieved this better than Super Mario Galaxy. Super Mario Galaxy is just one of those games where I feel like everybody forgets about it once it comes out after a while. I don't think it gets the recognition it deserves nowadays. Well, I mean, yes, it's true that the game is still talked about to a certain degree, and it sold very well when it came out. I just feel like everybody has forgotten how important this was to the Mario franchise. But in order to understand Galaxy's impact, we must go back. All the way back. Are you with me? The year is 1996, and there's only one thing on kids' minds. Every kid that year wished for the same thing, a Nintendo 64 to play the new hit game, Super Mario 64. Before this, Mario was mostly dedicated to a two-dimensional side-scroller, meaning you start left and you go right. But now you weren't hindered to that, you could freely explore wherever you wanted. People were flat out amazed at this technology. Gamers could not believe that you could now move in a 360 degree environment. This will also be The difference from going 2D to 3D was like when a lot of phones started to go touchscreen based. The difference was insane. The only problem with this was... What on earth happened here? They played Goldeneye with this. This is when Grandma stopped playing video games. Not saying the N64 controller is bad. I mean, this gives us the power of the Z-axis. It's just bad in a different way. You see, games were getting more complex, more complicated. There was a need for more memory, more stories, and yes, more buttons. But did they really have to design this around E.T.'s hand? I mean, with Nintendo, most things on a video game controller can be traced back to a Nintendo remote. When it comes to the four face buttons, the shoulders, L and R buttons, the rumble vibrations, the D-pad, this one pioneered both the rumble features as well as the control stick. I mean, after this, PlayStation even revised their PS1 controller to have sticks. But I'm sorry for all you N64 lovers, but this controller just feels bad. Not terrible, but bad. Anyway, I grasp this thing, my brain just says it's wrong! The N64 also had problems technically compared to its competitor, the PlayStation. While load times are almost non-existent because of the cartridges, memory was a huge issue. For example, Final Fantasy VII was released on the PlayStation on three discs. If the game was released on the Nintendo 64, it would have been spread out over 30 cartridges. That's how big of a difference there was. Even Satoru Iwata, Nintendo's former president of Japan, said this about the N64 when working on it. Nintendo 64 had a number of restrictions, but it truly was a full-blown 3D machine. Nonetheless, the limits it had were such that, unless you used it right, it wouldn't run well. With Nintendo 64, the size of textures was severely limited. If you didn't conceive something clever when making the data, the processing speed would drop dramatically. Nintendo sales of the N64 finally ceased in 2004, with a total of 32 million units sold worldwide. While not terrible numbers, but compared to Nintendo's previous console sales and their competitor the PlayStation, it was a massive disappointment, both worldwide and specifically in Japan. So with Nintendo's next console, would they dominate the market once again? Would Nintendo learn from their mistakes and create an amazing console once again? Well, let's see. When people think of Nintendo now, a lot of people point to some of their more recent successes like the Switch or the DS, and say that they've always had the underpowered consoles. And to that I feel like I need to smash one of their older consoles in their face. The Wii U stinks. Nintendo has always had the more powerful home console. That just changed when they released the Wii. They would always pound the competition with their library of games and hardware. Before the NES, this is what games looked like. Now they look like this. Super Mario 
Super Nintendo was pumping out 3D graphics with its Super FX chip. Nintendo 64 had a big O N64 slapped right on the front of it. And GameCube was no different. It was on par with the original Xbox, blasting past the PlayStation 2 as in terms of power. But like with the N64... Uh... Huh. The GameCube is one of my favorite consoles, period. Everything from the design to it, to the controller, to the games, Nintendo was on fire this generation. But these discs, man. Sure, they're cute, but like with the previous console, these discs couldn't hold any storage. Compared to an Xbox or a PlayStation 2 DVD, GameCube discs could only hold about a gigabyte and a half of space, while a PlayStation 2 or Xbox disc could hold up to about four and a half gigabytes. That's a big difference! So while games that were on other consoles could easily run on a GameCube, some decided to skip it because of these discs. But that being said, Nintendo's own first party titles, they knocked it out of the park. So many great games were on this console from Wario World, Metroid Prime, Star Fox Assault, Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door, and Zelda. And one of the best games on that console was their flagship Mario title, Super Mario Sunshine. Despite what many people say about Super Mario Sunshine nowadays, it's one of my favorites. Everything in this game, from the cool hub world, to all of its secrets, to how precise the controls are. Super Mario Sunshine is lightning in a bottle, just like Super Mario 64. But there are issues. Junior, I've got something difficult to tell you about Princess Peach. Man, Jack Black sure does have some big shoes to fill. But that being said, the good outweighs the bad in my opinion. When the game originally came out, people were praising it. Every aspect of this game people were loving. But as the years go on, I feel like people view it now as more of the black sheep of the Mario franchise. I honestly have no idea why, but... Super Mario Sunshine would go on to become the third best-selling GameCube game. The only problem in this is that the GameCube was way behind the competition. I mean, it sold okay, but at the time, this was Nintendo's least-selling home console, even less than an N64. Don Payne, who was a marketing director for Nintendo, had this to say regarding the GameCube's failure to compete with the Xbox and the PlayStation. With hindsight, I don't think we should have been trying to go after the same audience. Going head-to-head -head against competitors who had squarely positioned 16 to 35-year-old products and who ours maybe didn't chime in as much with. Don Payne wasn't the only one who had noticed the lack in sales either. Satoru Iwata took notice, and he decided to do the unthinkable. With Satoru Iwata noticing declining sales in their consoles, even though they were more powerful and right behind the competition, they decided that their next console shouldn't be focused on graphical capabilities, but instead follow their handheld route, use weaker hardware, and push that to the limit with a great library of games. Nintendo wasn't taking any chances with their next console. It was basically do or die. Their next console announced as codenamed The Revolution, they said it truly would revolutionize the video game industry, basically being an all-in-one Nintendo system. In an interview with IGN Cube, Perrin Kaplan, who is the former president of marketing and corporate affairs for Nintendo of America, had this to say. In the past, Nintendo has played the reaction game to Microsoft and Sony's first moves. Will Nintendo become the move maker? That's so interesting, because that's your perception. And if you talk to Nintendo about the Nintendo philosophy, we've always done things uniquely. While you might say that we're spending time looking at what our competitors are doing, honestly, we're looking at what we're doing with ourselves. Nintendo was really taking no chances with this console. While their handheld route was doing perfectly fine at this period, remember, their consoles haven't been selling well for the last couple years now. And then the shotgun wedding happened. Nintendo unveiled the Wii like a beautiful bride on November 19, 2006, and said, buy our console or else. And people just couldn't have enough. All I do is throw that ball up in the air, and what I'm oh, jeez. The buildup for the Wii was something I will never forget. My dad made me wait a good three years after it was released. 
At the time, I was a PC and PlayStation 1 player. I really didn't care about video games at the time. I remember a few generic Nintendo memories though, like I knew Mario, I remember Mario Kart would be played at get-togethers. My dad had a really old NES emulator on a computer called Nessie, and I believe that had the Super Mario Bros. 3 fish on it. But other than that, I wasn't a big video game player. Mind you, I'm probably at the age of 6, but all of a sudden one of my friends got one. This was also at the time when they were almost impossible to find, so none of the kids could touch it. It was considered for adults only at the time. But I remember watching all the adults playing Wii Sports and I wanted in on that. It looks so much fun. So while the wait was frustrating, mostly because up to that point my friends would keep getting them, uh, but my dad was smart. By the time we got a Wii, there was so many games coming out. I remember the ones that he bought me were three of them. Lego Star Wars The Complete Saga, Godzilla Unleashed, and Speed Racer The Video Game. Those were three great games to start out with. And to make matters even better, all the games that had been out were super cheap actually now, so nearly every week we had a new game to play. One week it'd be us pre-ordering a new one at GameStop, or another one we'd go home with LEGO Batman. Until one week I remember very specifically, my dad brought home Mario Kart and Super Mario Galaxy. I had a friend over at the time, and we were both familiar with Mario Kart, so that's what we chose to play. Plus, dad said to wait to play Galaxy with him. A little side note is that I would always watch my dad play video games. I enjoyed it just as much as playing. And while there's other game memories with that, the first playthrough of Galaxy I remember was mostly my dad and me just watching it. We had no idea what awaited us. This. This is one of my favorite games of all time. Super Mario Galaxy took everything from Sunshine and 64, but simplified it by trimming the fat of those games. The game starts with a very simplistic intro, and a gorgeous soundtrack to boot. Mario gets invited to go watch the Starbit Festival with Princess Peach, but Bowser kidnaps her. But for the first time, this isn't played for laughs, in my opinion. It's played with a lot of oomph behind it. It's very cinematic, and feels like it would be suited for a movie theater. And then right after that, the game just throws everything at you viciously. There's these planets with black holes in the center of Giant Goombas, shockwave spinjitsu, little stars that launch you, Psh, panel switches, star chips, and when you collect all five of them... Oh, this game is so good! Mario Galaxy is a game that is constantly changing. When you get used to one mechanic, the next level adds something to that one that you just learned. The ideas in the level design in Galaxy are always refreshing. Any other game would be a confusing mess with this many ideas thrown at the player, but Galaxy takes the baton and runs with it. There's so many great levels from Beach Bowl, Battle Rock, Toy Time, Freeze Flame, Deep Dark, each one having its own theme with accompanying music. The best way I like to describe Galaxy is it's a lonely game. Most of the background being enveloped in darkness, as you guide Mario through these unexplored territories of the universe. Defeating an enemy has never felt more important. While Galaxy's hub world is not much compared to 64 and Sunshine, one of the coolest features about this game is the more stars that you bring back, the more colorful and full of life the ship becomes, with the music starting off like a lonely small theme. to a booming orchestral sweep. Galaxy succeeds with every small to big moment the game offers for you. This is why this game is so important to me. Super Mario Galaxy will always remain special to me, not just because of how good of a game it is, but the memories that came with it. The best way to play this game, in my opinion, is alone and secluded when it's dark outside and it's nighttime, with nothing but the light of the TV illuminating your face. <laughs>